Welcome uh, everybody to uh, to the second day of, of our uh, money market uh, conference, and uh, let's jump right away into into that third uh, session, which is on the demand for for central bank reserves, and uh, just maybe to remind you of a few few logistics. So we have uh, one and a half hours for this for this session, forty five minutes for each each paper. Uh, so the presenter has um, 30 minutes, then the discussion 10 minutes, and then we have a we have a quick round for uh, also uh, questions from uh, from the whole audience. Um, the the questions uh, that you that you want to ask, uh, please uh, please put them in the in the chat and direct them uh, to all panelists. Um, I will put that information in the chat as well. And then uh, just to say we have to be a little bit disciplined with the time because the, the market panel after us uh, has to start uh, on time at uh, 3.35. Uh, so yeah, we have to we have to finish on time. Um, so I don't know if, if you're okay, I would maybe give you a quick signal five minutes before you uh, before the end of your time of your presentation um, and then uh, then we should be fine so so yeah let's let's jump uh, right away into the uh, first paper um, the the first paper is uh, is on scarce abundant or ample uh, a time varying model uh, of the reserve demand curve and uh, yeah Gabriele you're already visible so uh, this is presented by Gabriele La Spada from the from the New York Fed. So um, welcome to you, and and uh, yeah, over to you for the for the presentation. So thank you very much, Tobias. So let me first make sure that I can share my paper. Okay, yes, perfect. Let me start by thanking, of course, the conference organizers for including our paper in the program. It is a great pleasure to be here to present it here in front of this audience. This is joint work with my colleague Gara Afonso, President John Williams, and our former colleague Domenico Giannone, who is now at us. So the usual disclaimer applies. These are our own personal views. They do not necessarily reflect the views of the New York Fed or the Federal Reserve System at large or the FOMC. So as the title suggests, the paper is about banks' demand for reserves. And specifically what we are after is the reserve demand curve, which is the price at which banks are willing to borrow and lend reserves with each other as a function of aggregate reserves in the banking system. So as all of you know, this is a key monetary policy object for two reasons. The first reason is that when the FMC communicates its stance on monetary policy, it does so by specifying a range for the rates at which banks trade reserves with one another. And the second reason is that the Fed can indeed change the aggregate level of reserves in the system, but other factors outside the Fed's control can do that too. So from the perspective of the monetary authority, it becomes of paramount importance to get a sense, hopefully in real time, of where you are on this curve and even more importantly, of its slope, because that tells you by how much Fed funds rates, so the rates at which banks lend and borrow reserves, are going to respond to reserve shocks. So the natural question is, can we have a well-identified high frequency, and here I mean daily frequency, estimate of this demand curve and its slope? And that's exactly what we do in this paper. So we propose a time-varying structural estimation of the daily frequency of the reserve demand curve over a period of 10 years, going from 2010 until March 2021. So encompassing basically the old post-crisis period. Obviously, there are two challenges with such exercise. The first one is quite obvious. There are the typical endogeneity issues of any demand. And here I'm thinking about disentangling supply versus demand shocks, omitted variable bias, any underlying compound factor. But there is a challenge that is more peculiar to what we're doing here, which has to do with the fact that there have been many structural changes in the market for reserves after the great financial crisis. And as a result, the curve may have moved over time significantly. So how do we address these challenges? Well, we use a time-varying structural model on daily data. And you can think of our model as having two components. So first, we propose a flexible forecasting model of the joint dynamics of prices and quantities, so the rates and the aggregate reserves. Then in the second component of this strategy, we use the forecast errors for the path of reserves over time coming from the forecasting model as an instrument for our instrumental variable estimation of the structural reserve demand. 
and we use password there. Now, let me anticipate right away what will be up front. Daily data are key for our identification strategy. It's very important. So let me show you, let me give you a preview of our results right away. So here at the top, in the top figure, I'm just showing you the data. That's the time series of our main variables of interest. So prices, so rates of which reserves are land, and quantity, aggregate reserves. So on the x-axis, you have time from 2010 until March 2021. The solid line is aggregate reserves in the US banking system normalized by banks or the last to account for the growth of the banking industry over time, which is quite sizable since we're looking at more than 10 years of pay. Now, the dashed line instead is the weighted average rates at which reserves are borrowed in the, in the market for reserves minus the interest on reserve balance to control for changes in the monetary policy stuff. And I will be clearer in a few slides about why we need to do that. The graph is color coded. So we start with dark blue from the left when it's around 2010. Then it gets lighter, lighter blue, 2011, 2012. It becomes gray for the period that goes from 2014 to 2017. And then we have pink for 2018 and 2019 and dark red for the last part of our staff, 2020 and 2021. But what I want to focus on, of course, is the chart at the bottom. Because in that chart, we are comparing our model for the reserve bank curve with the data. So the dots, are our model implied estimates of the reserve demand functions. Those are five days ahead in sample joint forecast of prices and quantities. So on the x-axis, we have normalized reserves and on the y-axis, we have prices. So spread plus rates minus IRP. And the squares here represent the data, realizations of the data. So this figure is telling us two things. The first thing is that the model fits the data very well, as you can see from the fact that all the dots fit on nicely. On the square. The second thing is that the model is able to predict, to um, forecast the nonlinear demand function predicted by the theory. And that would be more clear later about what the theory tells us about the reserve demand curve. But here you can see if we start in 2010 with the blue, dark blue area, there is a clear negative slope that it decreases, then it decreases in absolute value as reserves expands, and the curve becomes flat as normalized reserves crosses 12, 13% of bank total assets. But the third and most important thing that this chart is telling us is that there is not just one curve over time. There are three curves. So the reserve demand curve seems to have shifted over 2010, 2019 outward, and then further upward after the onset of the COVID pandemic in March 2020, as represented by the dark dots. So what are the results? The curve has shifted upward over time, it has shifted further upward at the onset of the COVID-19 outbreak. The curve was flat during the period of 2012-2017 and after March 2020, periods that people refer to as abundant reserves, periods of abundant or superabundant reserves. However, although reserves in the system in our period were almost always above a trillion, and most of them above two trillions, we still observe a negative slope at the beginning of our sample in 2010-2011, and in 2018, 2019. Now, this slope that we observe is more gentle than the steep slope that people estimated in the 90s, they refer to as the periods of scarce reserves, but it's still there. And finally, the transition, the level for, of, of reserves or normalized reserves here, at which the curve stops being flat and starts displaying a negative, a significantly negative slope, is around 12% of bank total assets, both at the beginning of our sample and in 2018-2019. So here's how the, the talk will go. I will spend a reasonable amount of time on the institutional background because it turns out to be key for the identification of the reserve demand curve. Then I will talk about model identification strategy. I will skip the part in which we convince you that our model has very good real-time performance in the sense of out-of-sample forecast evaluation because they want a ton. And then I will focus on the empirical estimation and our main result. So let me start with aggregate reserves and their evolution over time, so quantities. So reserves are deposits held by banks at the Fed. And, and I think most of you have this figure in mind already, but I think it's worth it to spend some time on it because it's a very important figure. This is the time series of aggregate reserves in the US banking system from 2005 until March 2021. And this figure is telling us one important message. There are two worlds, two regimes when we think about aggregate reserves. There is a pre-2008 financial crisis, and there is a post-2008 financial crisis. So before 2008, reserves were in the tens of billions, and they were quite stable. 
after 2008, as the Fed responded to the great financial crisis, reserves jumped to the trillions, and they exhibited a much richer dynamics over time. So that's the time series of reserves. But how do reserves change actually mechanically? And here I need a bit of accounting, and this accounting will turn out to be important. So reserves are assets from the perspective of banks or depository institutions, but they are a liability for the Fed. So there are two ways reserves can change. The first way is quite intuitive. It's through expansions and contractions of the Fed's balance sheet. So for example, when the Fed purchases securities in the markets, he usually purchases the security from banks, and when it does so, he credits their reserve balances to the Fed. There is, so there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the expansion of the balance sheet and the expansion of aggregate reserves of the system. But there's another way that reserves can change, and that has to do with the fact that reserves are not the only liability on the Fed's balance sheet. There are other liabilities, for example, the account of the US Treasury, the Treasury General account. And when these normal reserve liabilities decrease, holding the size of the balance sheet constant, reserves must increase. So what are these non-reserve liability telling us? That the reserves are not across systems, and that's because on a daily basis, banks transact with holders of non-reserve at liabilities. And I want to focus on two important examples here. One is the Treasury General account, so the account that the US Treasury has at the Fed. So when then buys newly issued treasuries from the Treasury, they do so, they pay for the security by using their own reserves. So there is an increase in the Treasury General account and a decrease of aggregate reserves in the system when the banks submit the payment. And the similar dynamics occurs for tax payments, when banks can read tax payments to the treasury on behalf of their clients. The other account, the other no reserve liabilities that we'd like you to focus on is the overnight reserve capacity, or simply overnight error, which is used by money market funds to place cash at the Fed through reverse repos collateralized by treasuries. But when money funds place cash at the Fed, they are instructing their custodian banks to make the transfer, and the custodian banks are using their own reserve balances. So for an increase in overnight ROP, there must be a decrease in aggregate reserves in the system. So if no reserve liabilities were small and negligible part of the Fed's balance sheet or stable over time, intuitively they wouldn't matter for our access. But it turns out that they are neither small nor stable over time. So in the chart at the top, I'm showing you the ratio between the dollar value of all no reserve liabilities, excluding currency in circulation, over aggregate reserves in the bank. And as you can see, it's a sizable number and it changes a lot over time. So, for example, it, sta it started at around 40% in 2010, then it dropped to less than 20% in 2011. It stayed there until 2014, and then it started to steadily increase over time, exceeding 80% of aggregate reserves in the system in March 2020. But not only sizable, it also displays a very rich dynamics. So, at the bottom here, I'm focusing on the two liabilities that I mentioned earlier the TGA on the left and the overnight RP on the right. As you can see, the TGA was almost always below 100 billion from 2010 until 2015, and then it started to increase steadily, and it exceeded 1.5 trillions in March 2020. The overnight RRP, on the other hand, did not exist before 2014, but then its usage exploded until before 2013, then its usage exploded with peaks exceeding 400 billions, and now you can see in this chart, but the overnight RRP in September has exceeded 1.5 trillions, just like the TGA. Now, let me talk a bit about the market in which reserves are traded. So, that's called the Fed funds market. In the US, it consists of unsecured lending, mainly overnight. And the rates at which reserves are traded, called Fed funds rates, are the rates targeted by the Fed in its monetary policy implementation, as I said before. Now, what does the theory tell us about these rates? So, absent frictions, they should always be above the interest paid on reserves balances, which was zero, by the way, before 2008. And that's because no bank would have an incentive to lend its reserves at a rate which is below the rate that it earns on its account, by just letting cash stay in. At the same time, it should always be below the discount window rate, which is the rate at which banks can borrow from the bank, because no bank has an incentive to borrow from another bank at a higher rate than what they get from the Fed. I'm abstracting from market segmentation and stigma, but that's not important for what we are trying to do. So what does the theory tell us about this reserve market? So all the models of the reserve demand curve identify two regions. There is a region in which the curve displays a very steep slope. That's the region of scarce reserves, and it's usually around aggregate reserves requirement. Then there is a region far away from aggregate reserves requirement in which the curve is perfectly flat, and that's called the region of abundant reserves. Now, what's in between scarce and abundant 
Well, that depends on the model you're looking at. All models without threading frictions, they predict a piecewise linear relationship with a kink between flat and spin. Now, more modern models that allow for threading friction, threading frictions actually predict an intermediate region in which the curve display a gentle slope, so a smooth region of transition. Now, let me talk briefly about monetary policy implementation to motivate why what we do is important. And let me start with pre-2008, okay? So before 2008, reserves, as I said, were in the tens of billions and were not remunerated, thanks to strong incentives to actively trade with each other on a daily basis, and the demand curve had a very steep slope. So that meant, from the Fed's perspective, that the Fed could hit the target rate by just tuning with small adjustments the reserve supply through daily open market operations, because even a small change in the reserve supply would imply a sizable change in the rates. But how can you do monetary policy with a bond? Well, when reserves are in the trillions and they are remunerated, banks have lower incentives to trade, the curve has become flat, so supply tuning is ineffective. Even small, large, relatively large changes in the supply will not materially affect it. So the Fed they started implementing monetary policy to administer rates, so basically they change the interest on reserve balances and the discount window rate. And by doing so, it changes the opportunity cost of banks of holding their reserves in their accounts. So changes in the overnight in the interest on reserve balances, the IRB, basically corresponds to vertical shifts in the reserve demand curve, which we want to control for because they would contaminate our estimation of the reserve demand curve. We are not interested in these vertical shifts, we're interested in the curve itself. Okay, let me close the institutional section by talking about drivers of the demand for reserves by bank. And the literature has identified many three drivers of an upward pressure in the precautionary demand for reserves after the crisis. The first one is quite obvious, is the new regulatory and supervisory framework. So think of liquidity coverage ratio, living wills, supervisory stress tests. But even setting aside regulators and supervisors, banks themselves have changed their internal liquidity risk management in response to the crisis. And now they have a higher demand for safer liquid assets, such as reserves. And then there is a third driver, which I think is very important, and sometimes people forget about it. It's the fact that over time, after the crisis, the interbank market for reserves has become quite atrophic in terms of so the, the volume, in terms of liquidity, has become much lower than what it used to. So the lack of debt in the late by funding market, combined with the need to submit large intraday payments, has increased the precautionary demand of banks for reserves. And my co-author and colleague, Gara Afonso, will present a paper exactly on this topic later this afternoon. So let me move now to model identification structure. So <clears throat> we postulate this structural demand curve at the So that's a, the, the demand curve at daily frequency that we postulate for bank reserves. So S is the weighted average performance rate minus the IRB, and that's the dependent variable. The main independent variable is aggregate reserves in the banking system normalized by bank total assets, Q. Now, all parameters in the model, including the variance in front of the structural error, are allowed to be time varied. Our object of interest is, of course, beta. That's the time varying elasticity, elasticity of rates to reserve shocks, because that's the time varying slope of the demand. So, what's the trick behind this model? We're basically using a high frequency time varying linear model of stochastic volatility to capture the non-linearities predicted by the theory. There must be an assumption here for this to work, and the assumption is that the structural parameters that govern the structural equation evolve more slowly than the liquidity shocks that hit banks every day. And that's reasonable because it took banks months to adjust to the post-crisis frame, so the drivers that I was mentioning before. So let's talk about the endogeneity issues we are facing. So the first one is obvious and has to do with price interventions. Now, it's true that the Fed does not implement monetary policy on a daily basis to open market operations, that's correct, but it still does respond to unusual dislocations in the Fed funds market. And here, the example I want you to have in mind is mid-September 2019, when Fed funds rates and overnight repo rates spiked up on September 16th and 17th, when the Fed funds rates actually, the effective Fed funds rate actually breached the target range. Over the following days, the Fed responded by expanding the reserve supplies through operations in the repo market. And within a few days, both Fed funds and repo rates 
went back to their prior lives. Second type of legitimacy has to do with your reserve liabilities, and that's why I spent so much time talking. So not only they change mechanically the level of reserves in the system, but they also correlate to reserve demand shocks. And the reason is that the main holders of these non-reserve liabilities are key money market participants. Think of the Treasury, money market funds, but also federal home loan banks have all non-reserve liabilities, and they're acting both in the Fed funds market and in the retail market. So their actions, the usage of these non-reserve liabilities, both affects and depends on banks and demand for And again, an important example is what happened in mid-September 2019, when spillovers on the repo market transmitted onto the Fed funds market at the same time were correlated with changes in aggregate reserves. So let me be a bit more specific to fix ideas, and I give you two examples, important examples of endogeneity. The first one has to do with the window dressing of European banks around loan banks. So around loan banks, European banks reduce their wholesale, wholesale short-term borrowing. They do so to improve their regulatory capital ratios that are calculated. Now, that means that they demand for reserves, so the demand for borrowing in the Fed funds market also decreases because that's wholesale overnight. At the same time, though, they reduce also their borrowing from money market funds, which are their main lenders, wholesale. And what do money market funds do when they face this decrease in the demand for funding? Well, they place their cash at the overnight RRP, which implies that overnight RRP goes up and aggregate reserves go down. So the good thing about this compounding factor is that it reverts within a few days, and it's highly predictable. Now, the second type of endogeneity has to do with the treasury. And for example, with treasury options. So on settlement dates, banks demand for overnight funding increases, especially repo funds. And the reason is that they finance their purchase of treasuries and new treasuries through overnight repo funds. Now, this puts up for pressure on the reserve demand because borrowing in the Fed funds market, so borrowing reserves overnight and borrowing repos collateralized by treasuries are two subsidies. So there is an upward pressure in the reserve demand. But at the same time, when banks submit their payments to the treasury, for the new securities, they use the reserves. So there is an increase in the TGA and a corresponding decrease in reserves. So this is a short lead, but very frequent compounding factor. And corporate tax payments display a similar dynamic, they have a very similar. So how do we deal with endogeneity? So first of all, we clean the data. We drop one day windows around month tax. And this takes care of the window dressing of European banks. And that's the first example of telling you that using daily data is key for this type of exercise. But then we have a more general approach, which is an instrumental variable approach. As I said, it has two components. So in the first part, we build a forecasting model of the joint dynamics of quantities, so reserves, Q, and rates, prices, S. The model is basically an adaptation of the daily time varying VR with stochastic volatility proposed by Primitia in 2005. And again, the key assumption is that the forecasting model, the parameters of the model move more slowly than the daily forecast. Then we take the four past forecast errors coming from this forecasting model for the path of reserves over time as instruments in an IV estimation of the structural demand equation. To fix ideas, we estimate our forecasting VR, we obtain forecast errors here. We use five days ago forecast errors as instruments for Q in our structural equation. So the IV estimate that we written is usual as a ratio of two covariances. Yet the, the cool thing is that we allow these covariances to be time varying, but instead of doing Instead of using the usual two stage least square, we pull back our covariances from the estimation of the reduced form VR. And that allows us to write the beta as a ratio of two impulse response functions a denominator of the impulse response function of prices to quantity, and a denominator of the impulse response function of quantities to quantity. Okay? So, in terms of traditional ID, I just want you to think of this IRF, so the numerator as the reduced form regression, and the one other denominator as a first stage. So since we're doing ID, let me convince that our instrument is exogenous. And again, the data will turn out to be key. So the exclusion restriction is that the four past forecast errors are uncorrelated with demand structural errors. So let me tackle Fed's intervention first. So since 2008, monetary policy has been implemented to administer rates. So no daily open market approach. And Fed's reserve supply only responded to unusual dislocations in the Fed fund market. And that happened typically with a delay of at least a day. Think of mid-September so this is telling you that it's key to use daily data to build the model and construct the forecast errors. Now, let me talk about non-reserve liabilities 
and very endogeneity. So the key thing here is that these confounding factors have effects that typically are transitory and they last for less than five days. And good examples, again, are treasury auctions, tax payments. So let me briefly talk about the relevance of our instrument very briefly. So it turns out that our- Sorry, Gabriela, just to say five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. It's relevant, and this comes from the fact that we're looking at the post-crisis period where the path of reserves displays great persistence. And the second reason is that our model is good at forecasting the path of reserves. Now, let me move to the results and let me close with the results. So as I said at the beginning, the main result, the first result of the paper is that the reserve demand curve has shifted over time. So here in this slide, I'm showing you at the top, the same chart I showed you at the beginning. So those are in sample joint forecasts of prices and quantities from 2010 to March 2021. And the bottom chart, I'm showing you the out of sample joint forecasts. okay? So that's our model implied demand curve sample and the one at the bottom in real time. So the first thing to notice is that they're remarkably similar and that speaks to the real time performance of our model. Then the second thing to notice in terms of economics is that there are these clear outward shifts over 2010 to 2019. So the blue to the pink and then post March 2020 as represented by the red, the dark red dots. Uh, let's move to the main object of interest in our paper, which is the elasticity of Fed funds rates to shocks and reserves. So here I'm plotting the elasticity of Fed funds rates in basis points to shocks in normalized reserves, percentage points. The dark blue line over time, so 2010 to March 2021, the dark blue line is our posterior median, our estimate, and the shaded areas represent 68% and 95% credible sets around. So what this picture is telling us is that it was a significantly negative slope at the beginning, 2010 to 2011. Then it disappeared from 2012 to 2017, and then it emerged again in 2018 and 2019, and the curve became flat again as the Fed responded to the COVID-19 outbreak by expanding the demand. I also want to emphasize that these effects, actually, these negative, these negative elasticities at the beginning of our sample and in 2018, 2019 are actually economically important if you think that a one standard deviation shock in aggregate reserves would explain 50% of the in-sample standard deviation of Fed funds rates in 2010 and 30% of the standard deviation in 2020. However, the numbers are much more than the numbers researchers used to obtain for the scarce period, or at least for the pre-2008 period in the 90s. So there, is, there are several robustness checks in the paper, of course. So the idea of our main robustness checks is to explicitly control for compounding factors that people have put forward, like other money market objects that can also not only can spill over onto the Fed funds market, but also correlate with aggregate reserves. And clear examples are repo rates, T-bill yields, or money market fund rates. And the idea behind what we do is to just augment our forecasting model to explicitly control for this confounding factor. This, for example, is the elasticity that we obtain when we control explicitly for repo rates in our forecasting model. And as you can see, the results are remarkably similar. So let me conclude with the question that I think, or maybe the question I think is key for the Fed. And I believe some of you may have been wondering about for quite some time. And the question is, so for now, I've just shown you our estimates of the elasticity, the slope of the curve over time. But the question could be, for what level of reserves, actually, the curve stops being flat? Because the theory tells us that the demand curve is not linear. So in terms of the old model, the question is, where is the kick in the demand curve? Or if you want to think in terms of the more modern models, where does a gentle slope start to emerge? So here I'm showing you the same chart I showed you before at the bottom. So that's our um, structural estimation of the, in sample structural estimation of the time varying elasticity. Of the reserve demand curve. The only difference from our baseline, the only difference is that at the top now I'm showing you the path of aggregate normalized reserves in the system. So aggregate reserves divided by banks to points. And the dark red vertical lines correspond to the points in time at which the upper limit of the 95% credible set crosses zero. So in frequency terms, if you want, those are the points in which the acidity stops being significant at the 95% credit set. 
And as you can see, the point in 2011 was slightly below 12%, and is slightly above 12% for banks of Alaska at the beginning of 2018. So there seems to have been a, a shift to the right in this point, but it's not much. However, if you think in terms of nominal values of aggregate reserves, those two points, roughly 12% for banks of Alaska, correspond to completely different levels in dollar values. So they corresponded to less than 1.6 trillion at the end of 2011, and slightly more than 2 trillion at the beginning of 2018. So to wrap up, so in this paper, we propose a structural time varying estimation of the reserve demand curve over 2010 to 2021. So basically in comparison, the whole post-crisis period. We do so by using a combination of a stochastic volatility time varying forecasting model, forecasting era, and we combine it with an instrumental variable approach applied at the data. I didn't show you, but our forecasting model has excellent out-sample real-time performance. But the most important thing is that what we show is that the reserve demand curve has moved upward over time, consistent with drivers, the presence of drivers of upward pressure in banks' demand, precautionary demand for reserves, and its slope has changed significantly. So in particular, in 2018-2019, we estimate a significantly negative slope, even though reserves were around two trillion. Thank you, Gabriele. Thanks a lot for the presentation. And yeah, let's move right away into the discussion. And we have uh, Huberto Ennis from the Richmond Fed. Huberto, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, let me start by saying this is a, a really good paper. And uh, my plan is sort of to share some thoughts with you about the paper. Um, you know, I have this disclaimer down there that I don't think of myself as having um, views, but in case some of what I said comes across as views, uh, those are not of the views of the Federal Reserve. Uh, but what I'm gonna try to do is just share some thoughts. Um, to start, let me just say, you know, briefly, the, uh, sort of the motivation behind this kind of discussions is that the Fed, the Fed intends to implement monetary policy using a floor system. And uh, this is a, sort of the language of the Federal Open Market Committee on, on uh, January 30th, 20, 30, 2019. They said they, they intend to um, implement monetary policy with a regime of ample supply of reserves that ensures control over short-term interest rates, but setting administer rates and no active management of the supply of reserves. And, you know, there's a bunch of key words here, you know, ample, control, active management, but um, we'll maybe talk about some of those. Um, key question, uh, how much is ample? And this is kind of what they're addressing. And the Fed tries some other stuff. They try to ask the banks with some mixed results and, uh, what these guys are going to do is they're going to try to estimate the sensitivity of rates to the level of outstanding reserves and kind of get at uh, the sense of ample from that. Um, so the paper estimates an, an aggregate daily excess demand for uh, bank reserves in the US. And I say excess because um, in principle, some banks demand reserves and others uh, supply reserves. The Fed um, provides the, the net aggregate supply, but there are endogenous, like um, uh, Gabriel explained so well, there's a bunch of endogenous and autonomous factors that uh, change the supply. So what they do, they consider this equation, S is uh, the spread between the effective funds rate and the interest on reserves, uh, and Q is the aggregate quantity of reserves in the system. Um, normalized by total bank assets. And so it's just basically a price on quantity uh, regression. And uh, the slope cost, and you know, it's a sophisticated pro, uh, you know, procedure. And so they have the slope coefficient, this beta, uh, and all the other coefficients are allowed, including the variance of the shock is allowed to change over time. And, um, and uh, Gabriel explained very well why this is important. In, in this exercise. There's a classic endogeneity problem. This sort of you learn in, in is the first exercise in econometrics. 
like the supply uh, maybe moving in response to market conditions. And so you get the supply and the demand moving simultaneously. And what they do is they use a ID approach to estimate uh, the coefficient beta ba based on sort of exogenous changes in Q. Uh, and it's kind of a nice procedure, but um, I'm not gonna talk much about it. Um, Gabriele touched on, on this topic. I think it's important is that um, uh, Gara told us that you know most of the lending in, in the Fed funds market is being done by FHLBs, fair home loan banks, they're government sponsored enterprises that cannot earn interest on reserves. Um, and this creates a composition effect that combined with some internal management practices of these GSEs uh, tends to push the effective Fed funds rates below the interest on reserves. And, and Gabriele touched on this topic. Also, Garrett, uh, told us that uh, most of the borrowing is done by foreign banks to arbitrage interest on reserves. Uh, so this makes the pricing in the Fed funds market very idiosyncratic in my, in my uh, sort of opinion. And so the, if, you, if you are accustomed to think about the pool, the pool model of the money, I feel like that's not necessarily a good framework to understand the dynamics of rates and how rates move as total standing reserves uh, change uh, during this period. And, um, the, you know, the, the regulatory changes that Gabrielli mentioned and other things tend to influence the, the demand. And also this demand and this supply are very kind of, uh, one, the demand is, is coming from FBOs and the supply is coming from HLB that are not earning interest on reserves. So it's, it's a tricky, the standard logic of uh, that you know you one tend to use for downward sloping demand curves is really, I think, not a great abstraction uh, to use. Um, Gabriele emphasized the endogeneity. I'm gonna square it. Um, so if you know in their in their paper they discuss several channels that make the endogeneity. The Fed moves supply in reaction to market conditions, and and Gabriele explained that really well. Non-reserve Fed account balances move in reaction to market conditions. Repo markets and Fed fund markets are tightly connected and affecting reserve supply and rate simultaneity. Um, but um, you know they have their running their running example is these events in September 2019. Uh, the Fed intervened and successfully calmed this what appeared to be dysfunctional markets. Um, my, you know, my, I get the sense that expectations of Fed intervention partly explain the spike in the repo rates in 2019. So it's sort of like even the spikes were endogenous in my mind. And think of, uh, think of, uh, think of the case where there were funds in the sideline. So there were, um, there was short-term funding available after a long period of very high reserves, but those arbitrage trades that were needed um, to to counter the spike did not happen uh, had not happened for a while, and there and then there were setup costs uh, and other administrative procedures that need that were needed to arbitrage to to turn on the arbitrage machi machine, and so. Uh, on top of that, market participants participants probably anticipated that the Fed would intervene and squash those arbitrage opportunities in a few hours or days, just that, just that it happened. And um, so paying those costs was uneconomical because you wouldn't have a lot of time to uh, take advantage of the arbitrage. So I think it's important to keep in mind that the way markets function depends on the anticipation of central bank intervention. Okay, so there are results. Um, the, the authors find that the rates start to become sensitive to the quantity of total standing reserves when uh, the level of reserves is approximately 12% of total assets in the system. And that uh, sort of a, approximately $2.6 trillion of reserves right now. Now I wanna say that we, we recently, uh, the Feds recently uh, put in place the standing repo facility, 
that in principle might have changed that because the, in, you know early on in the discussion of this facility one of the motivations was that it would reduce the demand for reserves by balance now the slope coefficient beta is roughly uh, equal to minus one when reserves are eight percent of assets um, so that's about 1.8 trillion uh, on res of reserves now the way I look at things is the Fed targets a range of that has, is a 25 basis points wide for the effective Fed funds rate. And the range, the range of short-term fluctuations in total reserves is around $2 billion. Now there are these slow moving things, but the, the, the blips are around $2 billion maximum. Uh, so that's like 1% of uh, banking assets. That translates into a one basis point fluctuation in rates. So it suggests to me that even with reserves at 8% of assets, things will work fine in terms of targeting a range. Um, okay, so why, why am I thinking that? Well, you know, there are benefits of having a small- Sorry, Roberto, just, uh, one, minute, me, just yes. one minute, just one minute, yeah. There are important, um, uh, benefits of having a small uh, balance sheet for the central bank. Uh, political economy, uh, you know, uh, reasons, um, and also, you know, um, sort of price risk and, um, and this perception that, so things that impact the central bank independence, which I think are very important to, to sort of protect. Um, so my, I come out with some broader policy questions is should, should small and short-lived fluctuations in overnight interest rates measuring basis points be avoided at all costs? And I wonder, is this about bond trading and shouldn't it be about industrial production and more, and more broadly about GDP and social welfare? Now, this picture is, um, so these are, these are uh, five-year, um, periods and then I plotted the Fed funds rate volatility. So it's the um, fluctuations in the Fed funds rate in these windows. And you, the windows are 92 to 96, 2002 to 2006. So that's uh, black and green. And then you get to 2012, 2016. And, and then the red is, is three years for uh, 2019, 2017 to 2019. And you can see that the September 2019 blip is kind of small relative to what we were, we've been accustomed to see before. And I'm not thinking about how well we, we do with controlling rates. I'm talking about how the, econ the US economy worked di during these periods. So just to conclude, this I think is a good and important paper. It's very well executed, um, has ingenious and sophisticated estimation procedures. I think the finding seems reasonable to me, though the interpretation seems less obvious to me. And, I, and that's kind of what I try to discuss with you. Um, and then the policy implications is, again, even, even I, I, don't, I don't have it clear. I think, you know, they seem to suggest that maybe 12% 12, 12 of res, uh, reserves over total assets is a reasonable, it's, it's a good place to be in terms of total reserves, but I'm not sure that that's, that's the right way to think about it. And um, thank you very much and um, great paper, Gabriele. Thank you, Huberto. Um, well, just to check maybe whether there's a, a question from the, from the audience, uh, just seeing whether there's anything in the, in the chat. Sorry, I see. I don't see anything. So, given the advanced time, uh, unfortunately, um, maybe maybe just uh, back to you, Gabriele, um, whether you have a, let's say, a one minute <laughs> response or two minute response to uh, what Umberto uh, has just uh, laid out. Um, sorry for, for a bit pressing on the time. Okay, I perfectly understand and do my best. So, First of all, thank you so much, Roberto, for the wonderful discussion. I knew you would give us amazing feedback. Um, I will touch upon only a few points. So the theory and the fact that 
Pools model or other models may not be the right models to look about the result factor the next years. I think you're absolutely right. We want to be agnostic about the theory. We didn't want to take a stand. We just took what theoretical models tell us about the curve, and then we try to bring those theories to the data in a natural. I agree with you in particular that I think there's need for more theory that looks at market segmentation. So in the role of different players in this market because they're not all the same. It's not just about liquidity shock eating identical banks. So there's something more. And at the same time, I think there should be more models about that and more empirical analysis about the reserve bank curve at the individual bank level or bank type. So that's key. Now, um, I want to briefly talk about the interpretation and, uh, and what we mentioned uh, near the end about the need to produce the facts. And again, I want to reiterate, these are my own personal views, not the views of the Federal Reserve System. So I agree with you, I think, for most of what you said, in the sense of what our paper is telling us is that there was a negative slope. Let's take September 29th. There was a significantly negative slope back then. How big was the slope? It wasn't big enough, probably, to explain the huge jump to the interest rate. So this is telling us that it was not just about movements along the curve. There was something else. So this is pointing to the importance of the slow moving factors that push the curve up and down, not just the slope, but also the position of the curve changes and make it closer to the, to the upper limit of the target range, and which we have in the model. But and in particular is pointing out to the role of shocks, the high frequency demand shocks. That is exactly what we want to filter out when we estimate structurally the reserve demand factor. So I, I agree with you, and I think that one of the messages from the paper is that research should spend, and researchers should spend a long time thinking about modeling these high-frequency demand shocks in the reserve demand function that correlate also with aggregate reserves in the system. And there is a growing literature there from people like the Fed and our colleague Alan Copan has a paper with Daryl Duffy, uh, Antoine Martin has a paper with uh, Simon Potter that in some sense speaks to the same topic. So I agree with you. I think that we should not only think about ampleness, scarcity, and abundance in terms of the reserve demand function itself and the movements along the curve, but we should also think about it in terms of how it correlates about the shocks, the high frequency demand shocks that affect the interest rate and correlate with aggregate precision. So I think we should stop here. Thank you, Gabriela. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And yeah, thank you very much for presenting a, a very interesting and very relevant uh, paper. Um, I'm sure there will be ample opportunity to put this te paper to test in the future. Um, so so we'll, we'll look forward to that. We'll look forward to your results in the future. Um, and also thank you for Roberto, of course, for the, for the discussion. Thanks a lot.